Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Anup Gupta, and I'm delighted to be the host for uh, today's visiting speaker series. Um, and thank you all for coming to for this talk. And I know many of you who are in the online world, it's just too easy to click uh, than to walk across the campus. So we welcome uh, all of you too. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Rukmini Banerjee. Uh, for this talk. Uh, she will talk about the gift of education, you know, something that all of us who are here know on how foundational it has been to each and every one of us and how we can enable it for, you know, the billions of children who do not have that opportunity uh, today. Uh, she has also been the founder right from the beginning of many of these programs that I will talk about. So let me talk a little bit about Prathama and then talk about Rukmini uh, One of the things that's been, you know, very exciting to me personally about Pratham and some angles she will cover, one is about its education and, you know, uh, as I was saying, how deeply it has touched me and all of us uh, in our development. The second pretty unique thing is about the scale at which it has been able to drive change. Just in the last couple of years, they've touched close to 35 million kids. And the need is so large looking at the scale issues and how you achieve that, you know, is really important. It is also, you know, being uh, engineers and geeks at some level, it's great to see how a data-driven approach, okay, has driven not only change for the kids, but change at fundamental government policy level, okay, to drive the impact uh, at the scale and how they have, you know, in the part of scaling, not only their own efforts, but how they have uh, worked with governments. So it's not only lessons for India in particular, you know, but I think these are lessons that might be very valuable throughout the world uh, on how you know, education can can make a difference. Now, Rukmini herself, um, uh, you know, she's the director of many of the programs that Pratham has in the northeast states of India. She's also been the founder and director of this data gathering effort, effort called ASAR in Hindi, but, you know, which stands for the Annual Status of Educational Report uh, that they have done for many, many years that has you know, driven these foundational changes. Uh, she got her training in economics in India, but then was a Rhodes Scholar and was at Oxford and completed her PhD in University of Chicago. Um, welcome, Rukmini, and we look forward to uh, an exciting session. So I'm not sure exactly where to um, begin. Um, but I guess I thought I'd speak for a little while and then maybe let you ask questions and then that will be simpler to do. Um, my own interest in school education actually started in the U.S. I lived in Chicago for a long time and uh, this was about uh, 15, almost 20 years ago when there was a lot of things going on in Chicago on uh, school reform. And, uh, you know, I came from a, you know, fairly educated family, went to, you know, education was important. We didn't really have to think about why should children go to school in the kinds of families that I came from. And so living in Chicago, I think uh, a couple of things really caught my imagination. One was the fact that it seemed like uh, cities like Chicago at that time, and I think it's probably true even now, were struggling with very similar problems to what, uh, uh, you know, we are struggling with in India. And the second part of it was that the, much of the work that was happening in Chicago at the time was very community driven. So there was a need to sort of have local involvement in um, you know, how to improve schools. And that without that, it seemed like things would not really take root. So I went back to India and 
I had my, uh, you know, my academic training was in economics and with a uh, particular interest in children. But I would say that I have the US to thank for really wanting to get involved at the grassroots in education and also for sort of valuing the local, uh, local nature of how uh, efforts could be made to improve schools. Um, a little bit about the history of Pratham, because I think to understand what we do now, just a little bit of background might be useful. Uh, the two founders of Pratham, uh, one is called Madhav Chavan, and the other is Farida Lambe, are both Bombay people. And uh, <clears throat> uh, for, I, I, I see there are a lot of people who look like you were Indians here. Whether you are or not, I don't know. But Bombay is really where Pratham started, and Bombay is, I still consider to be perhaps our only real city. Everywhere else, uh, if you ask people where are you from, they may live in a city, but they always say which is the you know, uh, village or whatever, whatever they come from. Now, both of these people were university professors and uh, were working in the late um, 80s, early 90s in adult literacy. There was a big move at that time for adult education in India, and uh, they were uh, key members of a big urban effort. Much of the adult literacy work in India was happening in rural areas. And I think it's quite common when you start working with uh, adults at some point to feel that you have to work with kids. And when you start working with kids, at some point you feel you have to work with adults. I think it's a, I mean, it's not a chicken and egg because the adults have to come before the kids. But, <laughs> but uh, I think this is a natural process that I've seen uh, in other places. And they were coming to this conclusion that while they've been doing a lot of work with uh, grown-ups, especially with the women, they need to start doing something with kids. And this was a time that uh, there were some very bad Hindu-Muslim riots in Bombay in the early 90s. And again, uh, while we in India have had problems like this historically, Bombay people always felt that they were immune from bad things like these. And the riots really kind of cut across the city and divided people in a very kind of a, you know, pernicious way. And both Madhav and Farida, along with many other people in Bombay, at that point felt that there should be something that a city strives to do together, which is not controversial, which actually builds the foundations back again and brings people together rather than dividing. And what they came up with was this idea that every child in should be in school in Bombay and learning. The well in our every child in schooling and learning well has come thereafter. And uh, the, the idea was that, you know, Bombay is a big city. It was a big city even then, something like 15 or 16 million people. And so every child in Bombay was a lot of children. Uh, as you all know, Bombay is also a very, you know, it's a very crowded city. It's very densely populated. And a very large number of people in Bombay come from elsewhere. They are not uh, local Bombay people. So integrating families into the mainstream is something that families have to do if they want to really sort of take root and begin to work in Bombay. And we felt at that time that this every child in school would be something that you can't actually, um, you can't, I mean, it's not a debatable thing. You should be in school. And this would set the foundations for, again, sort of bringing people together. And people from all walks of life should actually want this to happen. And that's how kind of Pratham started. Uh, in the initial stages, when I joined, I joined uh, Pratham in 96. We used to work in a couple of municipal uh, wards, we call them, you know, uh, in Bombay. And at that point, the idea was that wherever we work, every child in that ward should have access to school. And one of the ways in which we thought that would be a useful thing to do would be to provide some preschool facilities very close to where the children lived. Very, an idea which is not dissimilar to the Head Start kind of idea in the US, where if a child goes to preschool, then the chances of him or her going on to primary school is much higher than if they didn't go to preschool at all. And secondly, it's not just that the child going to preschool, a child going to any kind of uh, uh, um, program like this actually enables the families to become oriented to what is needed to go further. So we felt often that the preschool programs that we first started were really as much for the family as for the kid. And that way, once the child enters first grade, the family has a support uh, in the form of the preschool instructor who could enable them to actually nav you know, navigate their way through a much bigger system. And so we started in these few areas. And when, when I uh, joined Pratham, I remember we had about 150 sort of community-based little preschool centers. And at that point, we thought this was scale. This idea of scale actually is very interesting. You know, words like scale and impact mean different things to different people. 
it's almost like Hinduism. If you ask any Hindu what is Hinduism, you'll get a totally different definition. And so for us, at that point, it was, it was scale. And I remember being very concerned about how do you maintain quality for 150 centers, and how do you do training appropriately, and so on. And we spent a lot of time thinking about these things. Uh, the model was very simple, uh, partly because we didn't have money, and partly because we felt that if you wanted to really get widespread participation, it can't be complicated. And so the model was that the preschool, and it was a preschool center, so you, it had to be very close to where little children could walk. Because you know, in slum areas, you're not going to take your child and put them in some kind of vehicle and take them to you know, wherever they need to go. So it needed to be very close to the home. Uh, Bombay, like New York City or like other cities in the world, has very high rents. So we clearly couldn't afford to pay rent to anybody for running these centers. In retrospect, this was a very good strategy because it meant that people in the community had to be involved. If you had to find space where 20 little children could sit, granted that they were little and often quite thin, but you still needed some space. You still needed this space to be freed up close to where the children's homes were. And therefore, people had to hunt high and low to find these kinds of available spaces. And you know, as is very obvious, if you look for space, you can find it. But you have to look a little bit out of the box. If the idea is that it's going to be a room and the room is going to have a playground outside, well, you're not going to find it. But if you look for spaces where children normally live and where people are willing to create the space, then spaces can be found. The instructor was a local person because, again, she had to be very familiar to the children. So usually a young woman, sometimes a young mother herself, who was from the local area. So she was also not a threatening figure, not a highly skilled teacher. But the idea was that if it was a local person, she could be trained and she could operate right in her own neighborhood. So this was the essential model. And by 98, we had 3,000 such little centers all over Bombay. So this, I find that even though we've done many things subsequently, this movement from 150 to 3,000 happened almost sort of in spite of ourselves. And at that point, I remember we tried to do an exercise to figure out whether every child in Bombay had access to preschool. And I won't bore you with the details, but how do you estimate something like this is also quite an interesting challenge to figure out, you know, if, is it true, were we able to provide access to preschool to any child in Bombay who wanted to go to preschool? What happened with this vast network was um, a couple of things. One is that as core people uh, in Pratham, we never planned that, you know, although the idea was that every child in Bombay, the way it happened was that the demand actually grew from the existing uh, programs on the ground. And so, you know, one preschool teacher would obviously say to her friends and to her relatives, this is what I'm doing. And it was a very odd thing to do because there wasn't much money in it. Uh, I think from Pratham's side, at that point, we used to give them a little stipend of 250 rupees, which even at that time, you could earn much more by washing dishes in somebody else's house. So the, the, it was just a token amount that Pratham would actually give uh, the instructors. And everybody was encouraged to take fees from children if the children were able to pay. The only um, uh, criteria was that you couldn't turn anybody away if they couldn't pay whatever uh, you were asking. And typically, every little preschool center would have their own kind of dynamic about what would be affordable and who could come. Uh, <clears throat> each of these, I think, preschool uh, instructors, as well as the community in which this was happening, then began to talk to other people. And every week, we would get demands to say, I want to start in my own area. And I remember being in the office where a couple of women came and said that, why are you not starting the preschool program in my area? So my uh, reaction to that was that I never started it in, in the other areas anyway. It was somebody from there who wanted to start it. And all we can do is to assist you by giving you some training and maybe a little bit of materials and sharing our experiences. And so literally the whole movement began like this by people seeing a model that was kind of doable by kind of ordinary people and then actually demanding that I need to have one in my own area. And people were told all along that there isn't any money in this. So if you want to do it and you want to sustain it, it really depends on your own enterprise as to how you can do this. If there is a need in the community, then the community will support you. And the support may not be in terms of money. The support may be in terms of space. The support may be in terms of all sorts of other things. And that's how kind of the first uh, scaling up, uh, so to speak, happened. The other thing that happened was that other needs began to be surfaced through this network. So with 3,000, uh, the preschool centers, we call them balwadis. Bal means child and wadi means home. 
What it did was that it was almost we had a, a, a presence in every slum in Bombay. And Bombay is almost 50% slums. Uh, other needs began to be surfaced from the families of the children themselves. So here we were dealing with the three to five year olds. What about the older brothers and sisters who are not going to school? People may have moved to Bombay, the families have moved, there's been a discontinuity in their education. And now dealing with a large school system which requires paperwork, which requires all kinds of entry formalities was difficult to do. And as people began to see that there's some support was possible, these kinds of needs about what about the out of school children, how can you help them? And the other was that my child goes to school, but I can tell that they are not really making progress in the way that they should. So these were two other big, much bigger perhaps than, and more complicated than the preschools that began to come up. And because, again, because of the kind of push that we got from people, we had to come up with models ourselves. So now the trick was that we had two kinds of children. One were kids who'd been left out. So you could have a 10 year old who has not been to school ever or went to school in first grade four years ago or five years ago and has left. How do we get them into school? Or you could have a child who's already in primary school in third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade, but hasn't learned how to read and write as yet. And therefore is what here you call at risk. I mean, actually they're already beyond risk. They're already, they're not gonna make it. You know that. I don't know why we call them at risk. Uh, and so how do you really support and help children like this? And it became very clear to us, right, uh, you know, in, in those early days, that there's only one way to help these kids. You have to somehow accelerate the rate at which they learn. And without learning the basics, and the basics according to us were basic reading and basic arithmetic, you're not gonna be able to go ahead. But if I take a 10 year old and I spend three years building the basics, well, she's missed the boat already. So to a, for a 10 year old, I have to get her ready as fast as possible to be able to enter fourth or fifth grade. Only then can I say that she's gonna have a fighting chance to actually you know, make progress in the system. If it's only going to be a band-aid, then you know, I can just, you know, then that's a different kind of effort. And so from those early days, I think uh, we started working on how do you really accelerate learning? A lot of people criticized us. A, because if you're on scale, then quality and quantity must be inversely related. This is an idea that was prevalent in India at the time. But luckily, businesses have shown that that's not the case. So now people are a little bit more accepting of the fact that you could have both move together. But the other was that you can't, there are certain things which have their own logic and you can't make things move faster. So if children have to learn to read, they have to go through certain steps and those steps take time and you can't rush the process. However, if you have 200 million children in a country out of whom 50% can't read, I don't think you have the luxury of saying that we need to spend time and build these foundations, you know, in the way that is sort of, uh, that is uh, traditionally thought. Traditionally, what do we see? We see our school system as built of these bricks. There's a first grade and a second grade and a third grade and goes on. And there's kind of an idea that there's a linear progression through these grades. And it's, you know, you enter school at a certain time, which is five or six, depending on different countries. And then by 10 or 11, you reach a certain stage. And this is a natural progression that needs to happen. But if you have large numbers who don't fit into this model, then I think it's up to the country to come up with different models which can really speed up the process because there is no question that by a certain age you need to be in a certain place. Uh, you know, that certain place may not all bring you to Microsoft, but it, at least there has to be a satisfactory level by the time you are 13 or 14 to be able to deal with life afterwards. So this was our journey in kind of trying to figure out that not only do you have to deal with large problems, but also problems that need speed. But it can only be solved by large numbers of people who are completely ordinary people. So that the skills and the techniques that we need can't depend on very high levels of expertise. People always say that technology can help. And you know, I think technology can help, but at that time, you, know, you had to come up with methods that would help kids learn quickly that could be done on scale by ordinary people. And our own efforts were actually quite frustrating to us. I remember around um, 2001 or 2002, we had very large scale programs, we were working very hard, but we weren't making the kind of progress that we wanted to make. Uh, we were helping kids to you know, kind of move forward, but not like the case that I just described, not fast enough to get a 10 year old into fourth grade in a matter of you know, 
months. So this led us to say that you know we need to really stop, take a breath, and come up with some kind of a different um, methodology for how to do it. And I thought I would show you a very short clip, which is actually from that time, which shows you what kind of change is possible. Um, he said it's very flavor. simple, yeah, so right? Just put, like, the flavor. Yeah. It's a very, very short film, but it shows you the... sort of bring this alive to you that it doesn't take, it should not take years to get a kid who is already probably seven or eight to be at least reading up to second grade level stuff fluently. And we find that if you can read at that level fluently, you're able to at least propel yourself through a lot of the material that, you're, that you need to be uh, dealing with in school. You still need a lot of instruction, you need many more things to happen to you. But this first stage is a bit like riding a bike or learning to swim. There is a clear step at which I think we all, you know, you recognize this either from your own kids or from kids you know, that there is a time when you can't read and then there's a day when you suddenly can read. And that moment, as you can see with the kids as well, it's not just a, it's not just a cognitive thing of making the step, but it does something to your entire personality as well. So kids who can't read, if you saw the two kids, uh, you know, will be rubbing their nose, they don't look at you in the eye, the whole body language is different. And as soon as you do learn to read, you could hear even in the film, the voice becomes stronger. And so there is a lot of, I think there are a lot of issues that go with the fact that you have actually taken this step. Uh, for one thing, uh, parents, I mean, everybody likes kids who succeed. So parents who are seeing kids, they are sending them to school, but the kids aren't making progress adequately, often don't blame the school or themselves, but blame the child. And say that this kid is not worth investing in because he's, you know, it's not going anywhere. Teachers, especially if you teach in large classrooms, like kids who are above average because they are less work and they actually give you the satisfaction of, uh, you know, uh, as a teacher, they give you the satisfaction that you're actually making progress. But I think most of all, the confidence that our children need is the fact that I can succeed. And there is no better, I think, indicator to themselves than the fact that they've suddenly taken this step. And it, you know, it is very obvious that they, to themselves that they couldn't do something before and now they can. So this technique, which, you know, which we can talk about later, has a couple of very simple steps. And for us, as we developed the technique, it was very important to figure out an assessment that would help us. And when we started, it was an assessment really to sort out how would we deal with kids of different categories. So the assessment tool is actually a piece of paper which has letters, simple words, some sentences, like a couple of sentences, and then a slightly longer text. And the simple sentences are sort of like at first grade level. And the slightly longer text which is wrapped is like what you have to deal with in second grade. We use this just so that we could categorize the children we have and see that how many children do I have who can't yet read letters? How many do I have who can read, read letters but not words? and so on and so forth. So it was a very, very simple way of actually categorizing children for us to act. 
And we found that as soon as we did this, we came up with very simple activities that would help to move children from one to the other. And we would use this at the, at the, at the time that this was sort of de being developed, almost everybody in Pratham, which was several thousand people, all stopped what they were doing, each took a bunch of 25 children, gave ourselves a month to see how much progress could you make in a month. So you were actually tracking lots of children very carefully to see why is this particular child getting stuck and what can be done and so on. And so the assessment tool actually helped us to organize our own work and come up with the action that needed to help them to read. But at the same time, we noticed a couple of other things. That this was being done in a large, uh, on a large scale, both in schools and in communities. Now, you know, for those of you who've been to India, we are a very, you know, we are a very crowded country. Everybody's in everybody's business at all times. So when you start actually using this in the, in the slum or in the village, people want to know what are you doing? And so you say, well, I'm trying to figure out whether children can read. Now, 50% of Indian children who are in elementary schools, mothers have not been to school themselves. So for them, going to school is accepted. Everybody knows now in India that it's important to go to school. But what happens thereafter is not often so clear. So my, I'm sending my son to school or my daughter to school. And I can tell it's not quite moving like it should. But what is not moving? So we found that this simple assessment actually helped parents to get involved, even if they were illiterate. Because they would say, this much he should be able to do. Because this is a really simple thing to read. And so it helped a lot in sort of raising awareness that this learning business or quality or whatever it is, is not a complicated thing. It is as you get higher. But at the very basic level, this is what your kid is expected to do. And it is OK for you to expect that the child should do it. And if the child can't, then we all have to help the child to figure out what to do. So we had the technique. And as you can see, the, you know, within about 40 days or 60 days, depending on how many working days you have, for children, not for the babies. I mean, for the little ones, you can take longer. But for kids who are already at about seven, eight, the acceleration could be quite fast. So within a period of about two months, you could have kids who were reading fluently. The assessment helped us to track on large scale how much progress can be made in a short period of time. And it helped to share results as well. So after this stage of doing it ourselves, we now felt that we need to actually infect other people. And uh, the best set of people to infect is the government system, which has you know, large resources, big school systems, where a large part of India's uh, you know, kids, we have out of our 200 million children, almost 80% still go to uh, public schools. So how do we do that? So as in the tape, you'd see that the government in, of Maharashtra, which is a state around Bombay, when we suggested it to them, they gave us two really backward tribal areas. And they said, why don't you go do it there? Because if it works there, then we'll think about it. Now, how do you take, and each of these areas had about, about 20,000 children. A block in India is not like a block here. It has about 100 villages. And if you think that every uh, school, village school has about 200 kids, then that's, that's about uh, the size of uh, the population that we had here. We had only very few people. We also didn't have the resources to pay people to go off and do it. We'd have to use the existing teachers. So what we did was, above every set of about 10, 12 schools, there is kind of like a supervisor of schools or teachers. And we took our experiences. At that point, it was not a film. But basically said that what we want you to do is to listen to my story, listen to the technique I've used. Uh, you don't have to agree with it. But if you come like you have here, if you come to listen to me talk, you have to go back and for 10 days do what I say. Not for the whole day, just for an hour or so with kids who are as yet not able to read. 10 days later, come back and let's see whether you think that kids, there was a difference in the kids. We had two people in those, both in, in the blocks at that time. But to begin with, we didn't work with all the schools. We worked with the sort of the school leadership, as you may say. And the fact of the matter is that if you really focus on a problem and really work at it, you, even if you don't use the technique that I'm suggesting, as soon as you focus on the problem and say that this is a problem, I have to try and crack it, and my progress is going to be measured, change begins to happen, at least in education. Health may be a different story. And so 15 days later, when they came back, we were also able to see in the meeting, out of the 10, 15 people who were there, who were the ones who were most skeptical. So that our team of one or two people went and visited their schools more often and worked with the kids much more. Because the kids are going to make progress. We knew that. It's just a question of motivating the adults to believe that the progress can happen. 15 days later, when the meeting happened, 
at least 70% of the people said, I see a change in my children. <laughs> at this stage then, they were ready and we pushed them to say, now you call all your teachers and let's share your experience with them, not our experience, because our experience happened somewhere else. Your experience happened right here. And that's how actually the program scaled up to all the 20,000 children. Now we've done subsequently this kind of work in very, in a lot of other places, but the key ideas still remain the same. Uh, my own state is Bihar, which is one of the most backward states, and we've been able to work with Bihar government throughout the state by using techniques very similar to this. One is that you have a technique that works, and you have made it work. So you are convinced of your own ability to make it work. Therefore, you are in a good position to be a missionary. I don't think you can spread a mission that is not your own. I, I don't know, maybe people can. But I think it helps to have your own, your own uh, experience to sort of uh, drive you. The second is there have to be key people who also will try what you're saying and own it. If people don't own it, then as soon as you go away, your idea goes away as well. So how do you get large numbers of people to actually accept it? And the one simple way that they accept is it by doing it themselves. So out of this whole experience came this idea that you have to first recognize the problem. You have to realize that this is an issue that needs to be worked on. You have to devote some resources to it, usually time. Because money you may or may not have, but time, someone in the system, whether it's parents or community members or teachers, have to give extra time to the problem. And if you measure what is going on, that helps. Because you can then compare yourself to others and see uh, you know, what works. And at the end of this whole period, you have to have some kind of a sort of a benchmarking to say that we started here and here's where we are at. So this is kind of more or less how this whole big Read India campaign has worked in India. Around 2005, we felt that in areas where we are able to do this and work with large groups of uh, teachers or people from the community, change is beginning to happen. But India is a very big country. And in almost every population, we saw this, you know, it's, it's a, we often say that India is a 50-50 country. 50% 50 are doing really well and 50% are not. 50% can read and 50% cannot. So how do you get this to the attention of the whole country so that this whole business of, you know, it's not just you send your kids to school because by sort of the mid, by 2004-05, we had 95% children enrolled in school. So access is no longer a problem. Access is a problem in certain areas. But now it's a question of everybody's in school, but if they're not learning, they may as well not be in school. If you're not able to finish fifth grade, what is the point in wasting five years? And uh, you know, we, have, we also pay, uh, since 2003, a special education tax to fund this universal education, uh, primary education in India. So children are enrolled, there is access. As citizens, we are all paying extra money. But if, you, if the core thing of education is not happening, then somewhere on the national policy level, the attention is not going to where it needs to go. So in uh, 2005, we decided, can we do the kind of assessment that I just described to you, large scale across the whole country? We have about 600 districts in India. And out of these, about 575 are rural uh, districts. And so we decided around uh, 2005 that we would do a sample in all districts in India. By we would do it meant that we had the sort of the assessment technique we knew it worked really well. We knew that it made people think about what is going on. But we needed to find local people in each one of these districts. The district was chosen because that's the level at which the government plans are made for the school district. And it's made annually. So anything, any inputs that are generated could possibly go back into the next year's plan. And so since 2005, we've been doing the study that uh, Anup talked about. It's called the Annual Status of Education Report. Uh, the acronym is ASAR, which in Hindi means impact. But it's used all over the country, even in non-Hindi areas. And what this does is it gives you an estimate for India, also for your state, also for your district, on can children read. We also have a similar thing for math. All of the things that I've been saying, there's, a, there's also a parallel that goes for basic arithmetic. Now, this report has led, uh, in a, for one, it has you know, almost 600 different organizations across the country who are also doing this, even if it's just for a, you know, a, a short period in the year. But there is a current estimate available. So when there is big change that happens in states, you can track it. You also know that there are states where nothing is happening. Year on year, expenditure is going up. But on the basic 
basic level of, on the foundational level, nothing is going on. So it has made some amount of, I think, uh, uh, focused attention on this issue. And uh, very interestingly, we developed all of this in India for our own purposes. But we find that there are people from other countries who are uh, coming to see this. And now an asar like effort is being made in several African countries. We are on our sixth year. But the, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda have done their first year. We recently had a team from Mali and Senegal come to look at what we do, both at the assessment level as well as at the action level. Because once you assess, once you find your child has fever, you can't stop and say, well, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't need to supply a medicine. So this is sort of the way in which things have moved. Um, we still have a long way to go. Uh, the government machinery moves more slowly than you'd like. But I think for us, for the next five years, the big challenge is how to get parents to really demand that this basic stuff be done in school. It's still the idea among parents that uh, you know, if my child doesn't learn, there's something wrong with my child, or there's something wrong with my, you know, the way we are doing this, rather than that I need schools to deliver. And as a citizen of India, I have the right to demand that from schools. So I think that is the big challenge that sort of lies ahead, which is probably the challenge that many other countries are facing as well. We are not the only one. Thanks. So I guess uh, let's open it up to questions, discussion. Uh, you did manage to train local uh, people who are not probably a very great skill set, right? Uh, have you been able to translate the same thing to teachers in public schools? Because I guess one of the main problems is we don't have good teachers in public schools because of which they're pretty ineffectual. So. Um, the, the, a couple of things. And you know, over the last few years, many different variations. If I uh, give you the sort of the best example from recent years, Punjab is a state that is economically quite forward. But their uh, learning levels are actually, if you look at their economic status and you look at their sort of educational, st by educational status, I don't mean whether kids are in school. I mean whether they're learning. Punjab was much worse off than it ought to have been. If we think that economic development and education are linked, if that is the case. So what Punjab, we worked with Punjab government. Punjab is a small state as far as India goes. We have, they have 14,000 government schools, which means they have about you know, four or five teachers per school. So that's the number of teachers. Um, it took us about a year and a half. The first year, there was a lot of resistance and skepticism about whether this could actually be done within a large school system. And it took, I think, a good six, eight months to work out and get this ownership and this leadership from within the own system. What Punjab government did in the last school year was that they did two or three very important things. One is, of course, teachers were trained in this technique as well as, I think, more than the technique, they were trained to say, think about the kids who are getting left behind. And you have to do something about them. The second thing is that they managed to do something which I think is quite revolutionary, which is they managed to get away from the age grade system in school. All school systems are organized by age and grade. That is the organizing principle of schools. What they were able to do for two hours every morning was to divide the school not in terms of grade one to five, but in terms of children who have not yet learnt letters, children who can read letters but not words. And they gave it a nice name. They would call it Mahal, like Taj Mahal. So you would, you would be called Word Mahal, Sentence Mahal, Paragraph Mahal. And you could move from one Mahal to the other as soon as you. So this was one basic, one was the identifying the problem and training and giving people resources for that. Second was that you provided a lot of supplementary material to read at the level of the kids. So our textbooks often are quite high. But if you are if you're in third grade and you're having to deal with a third grade textbook, but you haven't yet reached you know, the basic reading level, you, know, you don't want to read a first grade textbook because that's kind of, you know, it hurts your dignity as a, as a third grader. So, but you need stuff that helps you to grade and move towards that. So the Punjab government took a lot of kinds of material that we had published it in very large quantities and gave it to children. And that was your storybook. It was not called a textbook. So you could then read your graded stuff at your own pace. The third thing that they did was they took measurement really seriously. So I remember I went to Punjab uh, before the end of the school year, around our school year ends in the end of March. So I was in Punjab in February. And everybody you met from the school system would tell you, you know, I have 20 schools under me. Uh, in six schools, most children have reached up to the story level. But in such and such school, I have 18 children left, and I need to move them. So there was a very strong focus on 
how kids were moving. Uh, and the fourth thing is that they invited, in schools that didn't have enough teachers, they allowed Pratham to mobilize from the village community to have somebody come in and help during those two hours. These people in the Read, our big campaign for reading is called Read India. And these people who are volunteers, village volunteers, are actually not compensated. So you have to actually mobilize people in the village to say, can you give two hours of time? You're not going to get anything out of it. There's going to be no money. But if you want your village to improve, you have to help. You or somebody has to help. And so this, this, you know, all of these things put together, plus leadership from the top. So from the state level, there was a lot of focus on uh, seeing this change. So they also provided for uh, about seven or 800 people from within their own system who were good teachers, who would be visiting about tw each person at 20 schools, specifically for the purposes of helping schools, sometimes carrot and sometimes stick, to see that everybody moved ahead. And it, it was a huge change because going from school to school, I, at least in my working life in India, I haven't seen schools where children jump up the minute you arrive and say, can I read to you? Can I show you that I've learned how to read? So it also generated a lot of enthusiasm within kids. Teachers, however, resisted this whole thing because this was a lot of extra work. So it's not that they are ineffective because they are not skilled or not qualified. I think the incentives within our school system for showing progress of children is not very high. And so this year, there's been a bit of a backlash from the teachers union who said that uh, you know, work increased as a result of the events of last year. So I think it's not a linear process. I think these things have to go. And uh, you know, it needs more years of this kind of a targeted approach to solving problems to see where it goes. But there are states in which teachers do accept it. There are states in which they don't. There are governments which think this is a good thing to do. There are governments which don't. But by and large, the fact that you have to focus on learning issues, now I think nobody can get away from. Because all the children are in school. What are you going to do next? So, sorry, you had? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think, so what, what I was curious about is it seems like that there was some particular method that you guys invited, which accelerated them so that within 30 or 45 days they could. Uh, so I was just curious if you could tell the, the method, as it turns out, uh, apparently is called the balanced approach. So it's not a phonics approach, and it's not a whole language approach. These are the two big divisions, at least in this country, on how to read. It, 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 we start, there fourth. I mean, I can, I can train you in five minutes, at least on the concepts of what to do. First is that every child has something like a storybook for themselves. And this, when you produce in large scale, even if it's black and white, large font, simple text, eight or 10 lines, it's a storybook that the, every child has. So when the teacher reads aloud, again, something very common that most people do in Western countries, you read aloud to your child before they go to sleep at night. Here, you would read aloud, but everybody had a book that they could follow as well. And when you read aloud, you point it to each word as you read. Again, very commonly done. When you read to your kids, often you point to the words as you go. So there is a, the kid may not learn the alphabets right away, but you need to you connect the, the sight of the word with the sound, right? And these are quite short. So you use a story for three or four days. And by the time you're seven or eight, three times I tell you a story, you've already learned the story. So you're able to recognize words out of the story. And from recognizing the words, then you begin to recognize kind of constituent. The second is that most Indian languages have a very straight phonetic structure. And for those of you who know Indian languages, it's called the barakhari. You know, every consonant and every vowel sound can be put in a very nice, neat chart. And that's exactly, you know, we don't have problems of English which is that everything that you see is exactly like how you say it. There is no, there is no, um, uh, there's no blackboard on which I can write, but it's a, the phonetic structure really helps. So we use that chart uh, to actually, in a way like a multiplication chart, where in the beginning you use it kind of as a memory device, but soon after that it's just a help, and you can move away from it and do more complicated things with it. So first you just move horizontally across the lines, so it's predictable every word, has, well, what's your name? Ishwar. Ishwar, okay. I need a name which begins with a consonant. Joseph. <laughs> okay, Joseph, right? Yeah. So, J is the, is the consonant sound. And the way our alphabet goes, it'll be J, J, G, G, Ju, Ju, J, J, Jo, Jo, Jung, Ja. This is the, the J consonant with the vowel sounds. I use it with any other consonant, the patterns will be the same. So, kids pick up the pattern. And then they know that if I'm looking for Joe, so for example, if Joseph couldn't read Hindi, as soon as he learned to recognize J and knew the pattern, he would find Joe. 
because he knows where Joe comes in the, and then he would look for the next part of his name. This is a thing that kids normally do with this chart. So we would use the chart for about 10 minutes every day, where again, I put my finger, I say it aloud, and kids begin to catch the patterns. Then we do a lot of oral word games, again with a particular pattern. So we would say, you know, use a word and come up with rhyming words. So let's say, um, Nani, Pani, Tani, Lani. It doesn't have to be meaningful words, but these are words which have this very similar sounds with just you know one or two things changing. Again, after two or three times of playing this, anybody can play it. I mean, we can play it, even though you don't know Hindi, because it's similar sounding. And then soon you begin to see the, the connections between what you're saying and how the it looks in a written form. And finally, the fourth thing that we did, which I think was the I think the most innovative thing, which is probably ours, was that we come from school systems where it's very rote oriented, where the teacher is right, and you are always saying you know, the correct answer. And if you don't know the correct answer, then you don't say it. So what we'd say is that every day the child has to say something. It's sort of like a show and tell that happens in US schools. You have to say something, and then you have to, and then you have to write it. So kid will say, I don't know how to write. Well, you may not know how to write, but you certainly know how to say. But what you say has to be your own. Or if I ask you a question, then you have to come up with your own thing. Now, as soon as kids start actually talking themselves and expressing themselves, which in most Indian classrooms is a, it's not encouraged. There's a correct answer. And also, as soon as you write, most children are afraid of writing because there's a correct answer. And we said here that you, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're seeing, you should start putting it down. Again, it sort of begins as scribbling. And they will scribble because you don't know exactly how to do it. But it begins to look like writing. And within 45 days or so, you are able to, if you're able to say things and you're able to use a chart, then you're able to write the, no, the there, is, there is a Barakari chart, yeah. yeah I have it short. So this, this, this is the chart. Here is J. This, oh, oh. Oh, I'm sorry, let me try and get it It's just skipping slide. There it goes. This, this is Joe. So this is the beginning of Joseph. And so if we spend another hour, you'd soon all be reading this. <laughs> I, I know you have to go, but. but. <laughs> so that's essentially the technique. I mean, it's, as you can see, it's sort of common sense. But now that experts have looked at it, they say it's called the balanced approach. <laughs> Uh, what language did you, um, when you sat in Bombay, did you use Marathi? Or? See, Bombay, uh, from the early days, Bombay runs schools in eight languages. So Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati, uh, Urdu, Tamil, Telugu, English. So Bombay, uh, government schools have always run in all these languages. So we will work in the language that the children either speak at home or go to school in. Now, out of all of these languages, English and Urdu are the tough ones, because luckily, English, you know, people learn later. But Urdu is like English. Urdu is not, uh, is not phonetic. But a variation of this technique has been used in Urdu also with good results. It really freaks out the Urdu uh, conservatives, <laughs> because that's not how you teach it. But it's very appealing to those who have not learned Urdu traditionally in schools, because we use a phonetic uh, method, which, so there's a big tussle on the Urdu front, but our method is pretty effective even in Urdu. And the local leader, did they have to pick a language? Because those kids may be all speaking different languages, right? No, usually a, no, a homogenous language group. So even in Bombay slums, if we had to run three, we would run it in the same slum three, but they would be in three languages. So, so that you can you know, stick to. And it was usually linked to what school would, what medium of instruction school would you go to when you went to school? So uh, this seems to be a real sweet spot. You're doing a wonderful job. Are you also trying to influence what happens after they yeah. learn to read, fourth, fifth grade onwards? And, and what are you doing about content? Do you find you have enough content that continue to stimulate them as they, as they <coughs> grow in skill? See, we are still at, I would say we have four uh, major market segments. One is the preschool, where really the organizing of children to come together in preschool, beginning to read aloud, you know, doing preschool kind of activities helps. So their content is not as much as an issue, it's more the organization of it. The next is first and second grade, which we feel that if you really tackle first and second grade well in the next couple of years, all of these problems should. I was actually just showing some of the preschool thing again. If yeah. So if, if you tackle first and second grade uh, and you know, build the basic arithmetic and the basic reading, many of these problems in subsequent years should be go away. 
The third one, which we've really tried to tackle, is kids who are in third, fourth, and fifth grade who are not at second grade level. And the fourth category, which now we are beginning to be able to have time to deal with, is kids who are in third and fourth and fifth grade who are beyond the basic reading level but need to be brought up to grade level. Now, we last two years, we've been really trying to see how do we cope with that, given that the people who will work with the kids, at least half the people who work with the kids are local youth, who themselves have come out of a pretty indifferent education system. And we find some of the elements that we've used before to be very helpful. This idea that you have to speak, you have to, if we read a story, so in the reading program, we would read the story and focus more on the decoding part of it. Now when we read the story, we actually have to have a discussion around it. Now this discussion approach, let us have a discussion about what, what is the story about. Let us pull from this things that you can relate with your normal life. Let us then create vocabulary lists of mind maps of things to do. These are the kinds of things that we are doing now where the impact is not so much on school tests. The impact is more on speaking on your own, writing on your own, which are rarely measured in our school systems. <laughs> but actually lie at the base of many of these things. In math, for example, once you're past this basic operational stage, the big next hurdle is fractions. And the way our Indian numbers are structured, you know, like here you say 21. We say 1 and 20, 2 and 20. I think we need some revolutionizing in the way we, the, the vocabulary for fractions is really complicated. It's not as easy as it's in English. So we are struggling with how do you do that? And the third is English is really needed. You know, no matter what people's philosophy of English may be, today, I think in any, at least in India, to move ahead, you need English. So how do you now, at least for uh, the languages and for math, the grown-ups know some of it. But we now in English have a double challenge. The kids don't know and the grown-ups don't know, but you need to all move quickly. So you need to accelerate the adults very quickly. So we are using, I mean, I mean, I think half of India is uh, creating English programs right now. I'm sure you guys are too, right? <laughs> Because this is clearly needed and everybody wants it, people are willing to spend time. So, you know, the way we are going about it is mixing your local language and English. Because if you actually look at how many English words there are in Indian vocabularies now, there, you know, I was in a village in Rajasthan, really conservative part, and I said uh, to, there was a group of women, so I said, what do you guys really want to learn? So they said, we want to learn English. I mean, there's no chance that they'll ever use English in their life, but they want to learn it. And then one woman said, I actually know some English. So her friends laughed at her. And she said, shall I tell you the words I know? And we said, yeah. She said, missed call, <laughs> okay. <laughs> bus stop, SMS for text messages. And she actually made a list of 10 words sitting in a remote village. And her friends stopped laughing and said, oh, those are English words. We didn't know. We thought they were Hindi words, you know? <laughs> so how do you use a blended, now that's called blended approach apparently, to use both languages. <laughs> so, so that's our next one. And in Pratham, we are not very sure whether after the fifth grade, we should really get into large scale campaigns because by then we are already seeing that in teaching fractions, for example, in Pratham, we have about six, 7,000 full-time people, me included. Most of us beyond a certain basic fraction is unable to explain how this whole fraction business comes about. Okay. So we need massive education in India at our level, you know, percentage. If you do a, in, in, in the, in the Asar uh, survey this year, we have a couple of interesting things. Every year we do a basic reading and basic arithmetic, but we do a few other things. This year we have four questions, which have foxed many states. One question is about a menu. Or one question is about a calendar. And there are simple questions off of the calendar. Now, a calendar is a normal part of life. Even in villages, you see calendars. And there's something like there's a calendar for August. And the question is, what, will, what day will 2nd of September be? I've had kids in 10th grade say, you're asking a question for which the material is not given. <laughs> okay, now, because we are not taught to apply, you know, like think on your own and figure it out, you know. So I have to say, what do you think 1st September will be? And I had an 8th grader say, you're asking me an unfair question. Okay, and that's not because they don't know, it's just because you're not, you know, you don't have to use your, you know. The second question is there's a menu from like a tea shop. And it says a cup of tea is so much and uh, snacks are so much and three friends go and they eat this, this, this and how much will it be? Very, very simple multiplication and addition. And this is to be given to fifth grade and above. And we're waiting to see when the results come in as to how many children in India can actually do these sort of what I would call everyday computational tasks. The third one is um, a tree needs so much square 
uh, feet or meters, I forget, to be planted. My father's farm is so much, how many trees can go in there? Again, people are planting all the time. They know how to do it. But this calculation, we had a percentage problem and we found that sixth and seventh graders in large parts of India couldn't, didn't know what the, uh, the word in Hindi is pratishat. It's exactly like percent, percent. You have to explain it saying out of 100, you know. So we are moving one level up and where we find that the basics of sort of applied arithmetic that you need in everyday life, you're learning it in school, you're getting okay marks, but you're not able to apply it to. So I think that before we take that step, we need massive education among youth to figure out you know, what to do. We are doing one uh, thing which, I don't know quite where it would fit in, but these large numbers of volunteers, who are community volunteers who are teaching children, so far have been doing it for free. And we feel strongly that they should be compensated in some way, and money is not the only way. So just two, three months ago, we've launched, and I think Microsoft has helped in that, uh, uh, to say that anybody who teaches in Read India will get a basic training in Microsoft Office. This is called education for education. So that at least you begin to build up a basic skill level of, you know, I mean, this is not dealing with your fifth grade and sixth grade math, but that, that everybody needs a certain amount of digital literacy. And a lot of times that these kinds of courses are available in your district headquarters town or in a small town, but not available in your village. So here what we've done is to say in a radius of 10 villages, there will be a person with two laptops who is there for four days a week and you have your slot. So you teach kids whatever time, morning or evening. And at a certain time, you can come to this spot, which has been picked with a lot of things in mind, but mainly proximity. Sometimes proximity to electricity has been the other one, where you will then, in a period, while you are teaching the first, while you are teaching in those 60 days kids how to read, you get to learn, you know, Excel and Word and whatever it is for the 60 days. And we are waiting to see what this connection, how this will strengthen, hopefully, the children's learning as well as some youth skilling. So this is being done in about uh, 20,000 villages, 20, for 20,000 villages right now. And based on this year's experience, we'll see how, you know, where, where this will go. And whether then the availability of these two laptops within a 10 village radius could be the place through which some of these other things which may need more skill, you know, should go. And maybe Kindle will come next. <laughs> I have uh, two questions. First of all, it's just amazing uh, the scale at which things are happening. I have no idea. So the first question is, how do you keep tabs on you, know, you as or the people in the center like, of what's going on when there's things are happening at such large scales? Like, how do you kind of keep track of things or even get messages out so that they're actually interpreted the right way? And the second question is, what, what, what do you have a call to action for us? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. OK, the first thing is, basically, we don't try to keep too much control. Because if you're operating on such a large scale, the basic messages should be so simple. So for example, the campaign is called Read India. So the goal of the campaign is that all children should read and know basic arithmetic. So you know, the messaging has to be very simple. And the things that you have to do have to be very, you know, three or four bullet points. Because you can't have fine print and large scale work like this. Now, things like identify the problem. You can't go wrong in that. I mean, you know, you may identify the children slightly differently. But what we are saying is children who are getting left behind, focus on them, give them time, measure what you're doing, right? So let's say right now in India, we are working in, um, we've, we, a couple of years ago, we were very large scale. The last two years, we've decided to kind of consolidate so that we can build our own capacities better for doing slightly higher level things. So we are currently working in about 250 blocks. So each block has, say, 100 to 200 villages. In a block, we have a set budget. So it's not just about running programs. It's about handling people, handling money. And the budget is 500, 5 lakh rupees, 500,000 rupees for a whole year to improve reading levels in these 100 villages. There are five full-time people. Each person has 10 village, uh, 20 villages or 25 villages to handle. And the basic measurements are put in place. So here's your money. Here's the training. Here's your measurement. 
and there will be some external evaluation as well. So we do some internal external evaluation as well. So for a sample of all of these blocks, there will be a baseline and an end line that will happen. So you collect your own data, which is also very straightforward and simple. It's not very complicated because you need to collect the data not for me. You need to collect it for figuring out what's happening to your kids. So that measurement is integral to your work. And more or less that's, you know, it's, 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 um, you have to come and visit because it's, it's a difficult, I mean, I don't know. So what you saw there was, you know, I was visiting there and mm -hmm. it's rarely, you know, it's exam in terms of how the teachers, how the volunteers, how everything is working. There's also some literature in the back that, you know, which... And volunteers come in pretty much like you've come in. There was some announcement, I'm sure. Some of you must know Anoop. You're kind of curious. So I have, for example, how do so many people in India, why are they all, you know, this is not like Teach for America where it's somebody who's very highly qualified coming from somewhere and this is going to be look good on their CV and all that. This is like you're a village kid. You've actually graduated from the same school system. Somebody comes and tells you, we often do village report cards using our assessment thing just to generate interest in the village. And then we say, <clears throat> if you want to help your village, I can help you. But if you don't want to help your village, you know what? India has 600,000 villages. I'm going to the next village. Then usually people will say, no, 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 don't go. Wait, wait, wait. No, we need to do something here. So, you know, every village you can find a couple of people who are willing to give time and who also see that they have been successes uh, you know, on their own. Uh, I was in a village in Bihar and uh, there was some agitation going on in the city nearby for uh, something, I forget. You know, college students were agitating to say they didn't get enough uh, you know, jobs in the railways or something like that. So I asked uh, the couple of girls who had volunteered for the program, I said, how come you're not agitating? She said, oh, you know, the boys are agitating because they were very bright. But, you know, we were not very bright, so we are helping the children. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what are they going to get out of agitating there? She said, who knows? They must have their own calculations. We felt we've already finished high school. There's something I can do here. Why shouldn't I do it? So the motivations for why people volunteer is also quite interesting. It's not all that I'm going to save my country and things like that. It's like, you know, this made sense. I could do it here. I had some time, so let me do it, you know. Joseph, at a very just local level in some sense, you know, there's certainly the, there is a Seattle chapter of Pratham, okay, uh, that we have. And, you know, you can give in the giving campaign. There's a gala tomorrow um, uh, evening at, where is it, the Grand Hyatt? At the Grand Hyatt. So, you know, anybody who's interested, get in touch with me and I'll certainly supply some basic information to But if anybody has reason to go to India, do let us know because I think uh, what I find is that the way all of this has moved ahead is by new people looking at the issues. You know, you don't necessarily have to give up your life and come and work with us. But I think that every new set of eyes sees a new angle that could be improved and also adds to you know, what we are doing. Yeah, so, so also using computers and things, so yeah. you know, to the extent we might think that, you know, if it helps, I'll just show you a picture, right? and you can cut me on, you know, basically. So, uh, a question. Right. A side question was, how do you keep tabs on, uh, not keep tabs on, how do you aggregate all the individual stories to kind of get a sense of what's happening, keep the power? Is there a process for that? So, yeah, so the, you know, we have structure. So there's a district structure, there's a state structure, you know, people meet once a month, you know, at different levels. Uh, once a quarter at different levels. But I would say that our, uh, I mean, maybe because I'm very keen on assessment, I feel that the assessment structure keeps us all united, both in terms of the message and also in terms of what progress we've made. And so in that sense, I find that the measurement is really important, not just for the data it creates, but also for the, the, the uniform, I mean, for the unity, actually, that we are all working on the same thing. We may do it differently, but we're all, the goal is the same, and we are trying to kind of measure our progress to the goal. Um, so let's have the last yeah, question, and then what I'll do is we'll end, Rukmini will still be around, so we can ask, but it gives an opportunity for those who want to, you know. I'm just wondering how much of influence have you had on the government system? Have they actually adopted your techniques and encouraged more sort of discussion within the classroom, getting the kids to use their own mind and apply the techniques that they've learned? See, I would say that uh, we have to break down the F impact on government in different ways. Uh, firstly, we are also a federal system. So it's like different governments are at different places at different times, you know, in their thinking. One big thing that has happened as a combination of Asar and Read India is that the annual plans that are made for every district in India are based on certain guidelines, line items. Uh, three years ago, a new line item appeared, which said, how much learning can you guarantee your children? How much money do you need for that? 
So I would say in terms of allocation of budgets, there has certainly been a big impact. So that's number one. Number two is that out of say the 20 major states in India, we have worked with governments in partnership and there we say that you don't subcontract to us because we are not subcontractors. We are willing to work with you, which means we need to have joint teams. Now when we have joint teams, there are lots of dynamics because other than me and a few people in Pratham, everybody else is between the age of 18 to 25. So to sit in government meetings when you're 20 years old and talk to somebody who's 50 to say, oh, by the way, I think you can do it better is a big learning on both sides. Okay, and if you are along, I mean, the first day it's not good because people say, just shut up and, you know, be quiet. You were born yesterday. But if you're together for a year, then there's a lot of osmosis that happens. And also, I think that what, what happens is the mid and the lower level government people begin to appreciate the energy. So they may not accept your technique in terms of the pedagogical technique, but they begin to accept sort of some of the principles that we have, which is there is a problem, we need to deal with it. The only way we can deal with it is to run around. You cannot solve problems by sitting on a desk. So I would say that the impact in terms of the fact that change can happen, we need to have learning goals, has perhaps been greater than the actual taking of the pedagogy. What about the teachers who don't resist this technique? Have you seen a change in their Yeah, I would say, style? yeah. But, but this has to be constantly reinforced. You as an individual will not be on your own path. I mean, there are some outstanding teachers. They will use their own techniques anyway. But a bulk of mediocre people have to be supported and sort of incentivized, not just in, ter not in terms of money, but in terms of sort of, uh, yeah, right. And we've seen the best results come when the government machinery takes this seriously and there is large scale community support, because then that seems to give you the best results. Some of the most backward states have shown the best results. And when we analyze it, this is what we think it is, that the whole centralized system takes it seriously by you know, having training, having their own measurements, having their own supervision, senior people visiting. You know, we, uh, in India, a lot of people sit on their desks and rule the country. As soon as you see senior people moving around to the schools, that's inspirational to say, this is really important. That's why people are moving around. And then having this large scale village volunteer. So it's not an either or. It's sort of like to get a kid educated well, you need a good school and you need a good family or a good community. You kind of need both. And when families are themselves illiterate and they want education but they don't know quite what, then you need a lot of community support to sort of push them. And I think on that front, we need, I mean, on the government, we need to do more as well. But in a way, with centralized systems, you know, it's, it's in a sense a little bit easier than, you know, 200 million parents, 100 million of whom have not been to school or have been to very indifferent school, convincing them that you need to pay attention to your children's learning, even though you're illiterate yourself. So that's, I think, the big challenge that at least I feel for the next five years. And how can you do this without actually educating the parents? You know, so do we have to go back into an adult education frame to actually, you know, get them to what is the motivation system that you could use with maybe technology would be one way. Um, so I, w I think that's... Let's give Rukmini a big hand for you. <laughs>